morning, everyone. I hope that you're having a good time so far in the conference. This is the, the third day, if I'm not mistaken. There's plenty of content for you today as well. And uh, so today, and uh, let me share my screen first. And so we get started. Uh, here we go. So what I want to talk today is about a build tool, uh, Maven. Uh, that's probably a build tool that most of you know. Uh, so before we get into that, my name is Andrew Salmirai, and uh, I'm a senior principal uh, product manager at Oracle. So I prefer the title uh, seasonal sorcerer because I like to work with source code a lot. And uh, one of the things that we do at my team, which is at the database group, is that we, we produce a lot of code and products and projects that are actually open source. So if this is something that interests you, the database and open source and Oracle, please talk to me because that's one of the things that I like to do. Anyway, so let's get into the topic. And I wrote in the chat that if you have a burning question, just ask away and uh, the moderator will let me know and we can solve the question immediately or you can wait till the end of the session uh, for the Q&A. So as we know, Java, uh, the language that, that we know and love had, was released a bit more than 26 years old. And um, when Java was created, uh, it was created in such a way that the syntax was very close to the dominant language at the time, which was C and C++. This allowed developers to jump from one language to another very quickly. And because the language was new, it also reused most of the stuff that existed. So the way that you built a Java project was well, using the compiler. But if you wanted a build system where there was nothing that was native to Java, let's call it like that, it was only make. And because Java gave us this uh, option of compile once, run everywhere, so high portability of your code, we needed a way also to have high portability of the build system. So make wasn't going to cut it. So some time passed and a group of developers created Apache Ant for the, uh, the Tomcat, uh, for, for Apache Tomcat, if I'm not mistaken. So the advantage of Ant is that it's a portable build system. Uh, it pretty much lets you uh, define everything that you need in your project, but that's also one of the drawbacks because there are no conventions. And uh, if you wanted to reuse the build for another project, you will have to copy and pray once you made any modifications. And it's also a product of design. Uh, so we know that in order to define build files in the end, you have to use XML. And we know there are not that many people that are very familiar or very happy using XML. But this allowed projects to be portable and to grow in size. And the grew is so much big that there was a need for another build tool. And around 2002, 2003 is when Maven came to. So Maven gave us the power of conventions, uh, dependency to resolution, plugins, and so many of the things that we now take for granted. It still uses XML again because it's a product with time, but it also allowed us to have much bigger projects. Now, around 2007, 2008, a group of developers were tired of using Maven uh, because apparently Maven was too strict. It was, it had a very fixed structure. And so it's pretty much the Maven way or the highway. So they wanted to have something that was more flexible and that's how they created Gradle. Now Gradle doesn't use an XML, uses a started with a group of DSL, now it has two DSLs. And uh, this is the time, 2008, when I switched to Gradle because I said, I don't like XML. I don't understand why Maven is so, uh, so strict, so constrained, if you will. So I switched to Gradle and I didn't look back until many, many years later. And this is why I lost completely track of what's happening in the Maven space. So I've been promoting Gradle for a long time, 12 years, but I had a hard look again into Maven so that the features that I thought Maven didn't have and Gradle did actually are found in Maven. And there are some things that Maven can do that Gradle can't. So this is the reason for this session. Uh, coming back to Maven, having a different look at it from a perspective of someone that, that used to hate it and uh, someone that is used to using other build tools such as Gradle and to see what actually makes it tick. Some of the features that I'm going to talk today, uh, you may already know them and some of them will probably be new to you or 
you will find a different way to use them in your build tools. So to begin with, <clears throat> overriding project properties. So you can define project properties in a couple of ways. Uh, the most typical one is using the properties block in a POM file. So you just define key value pairs and that's it. Uh, plugins also have the option of exposing the uh, parameters as properties, as long as they have the right configuration, any field that is annotated with the app parameter will also be visible as a property. And you can define properties on the command line as well. Now, depending on what, what the things that you're doing, you can override values that have already been defined or been exposed by plugins via these properties. You can override and pass in values on the command line, just use the dash D um, parameter. So let me show you a quick demo of this. Uh, let's switch into the terminal. All right. So here we have it. This, whoop, that's a simple terminal. Here we go. And uh, I have this POM file right now. It's a very trivial application. It only has the GAF coordinates, which stands for group ID, identifier ID, and version. So from henceforth, I'm going to refer to just GAF. And uh, it has single dependency. Now, also, this project has one source file. And that particular source file is executable. That's the only thing that I want to say right now. OK. So let's look at uh, which version of Maven I have installed. Hopefully I have the latest version. No, I have version 3.6.3. The latest version is 3.8.3. There are many ways for you to install it. Uh, the way that I prefer to install Maven is by using SDK Man. But not, I'm not going to do it because it's going to take a couple of minutes for, to download it. So I'm going to stick with 3.6.3 for now. I also have Java 1.8. Yeah, configure. All right. So what I'm going to do is compile the code. And uh, notice that I'm using Java 8. So I will, I will expect the um, generated bytecode to be uh, 1.8. How can we tell that one? Well, once we have compiled code, I'm going to decompile it with uh, Java P, uh, I think is dash B, dash S, no, dash P, if I'm not mistaken. And then do target uh, classes. This thing is running the way. Let's move that. Uh, target classes come at me sample. And let's do less. And we get my major version 49. Uh, does everyone know what version of Java that is? That is actually Java 5. So what's going on here? So Maven has some defaults. Um, so that you don't have to specify everything. And the default ver uh, Java version for Maven 363 is Java 5. So there are ways that I can ensure my code gets compiled with the right bytecode. So one way to do it is edit the POM file and add a plugin section from the Maven compiler. Another one is to add just one property, which is a Maven compiler source or Maven compiler target. Or another thing that I can do is specify that on the command line. So I'm going to clean the project. Um, and then I'm going to say maven minus d maven compiler target equals. And sorry for interrupting. We have our first question. Yes. What is GM? GM is an alias that allows me to run maven or is maven wrapper. All right. Thank you. Uh, because if you know, if you didn't know, there is a Maven wrapper that existed for more than eight years, and that Maven wrapper will be added to Maven four. So that way, you can uh, provision the right version of Maven to run with your project. And this is very important because the Maven super pump, which is the parent of every single pump you find there, its uh, its version is given by the version of the Maven. Um, of, of the Maven executable that you use at that time. So if you run your pro your project with Maven 3.6 or Maven 3.8.3, if the super pond change, you will see that there are differences in the plugin versions. So it's a good thing to fix a particular version and the Maven wrapper allows you to do that. So what I'm going to do here is compile, um, passing 1.8 and say compile now, All right? So we'll see that it's going to, uh, 
built. And by the way, this line here is produced by GM. It tells me that is running the Maven wrapper that is found in this particular project because I set it up. And it tells me the path for the whole POM file that I'm executing right now. So in this way, I can tell that I'm actually executing the thing that I wanted to do. Okay. So now that I have compiled, I'm going to decompile again the class. And let's look. Now it's major version 52. So this is Java 8. This is what we wanted. So, and the only thing that I needed to do was pass in the parameter in the command line. So this is very easy to do. And it will come back in just a moment. So here we go. So the next thing is that you can invoke any plugin, any golf or any plugin without having to configure them in the POM file. This is great. This is something that Gradle doesn't do. So the idea is that if you know the gap coordinates for a particular plugin, then you just pass it in. If you do not set the version number, then maybe we'll resolve the latest version for that particular plugin. And uh, if you have any parameters, any additional parameters that are needed for the goal, well, now you know you can set them through the command line. You don't have to edit the POM file to make this work. So for example, if I wanted to run the echo plugin, on any Maven project. So it's just a matter of passing the, uh, the gap coordinates for echo. The latest version for this plugin is one to zero. And uh, then it requires either two parameters. One is the message or another is a file that contains the message that you want to, to output to the console. So in this case, I'm passing just one parameter, the message. Now I can show you a quick demo of this. Uh, I do have a couple of parameters here, commands. Uh, that's not the one I want. I want command number three, this one. Okay. So this is the execution I wanted. But we probably will take out that. That's not going to work. So let's do it. Invoke Maven and pass in the gap coordinates, the full gap coordinates. So that's it. And then I'm going to invoke the echo go and uh, say minus the echo message, hello, Jcon 2021, all right? And invoke this. Remember that my POM file has no notion whatsoever of the echo plugin. Hey, Andres, we have a second question from Theo. He wants to know, would the plugin then be installed if invoked as parameter? Yes, and that's exactly what I'm showing here. I did not have the echo plugin installed before. So Maven always has to resolve dependencies and plugins and put them into a repository. In this case, it will be my local repository. I only have one remote repository, which is Maven Central, from where we can resolve both plugins and dependencies. So what we're seeing here is that because I didn't have the echo plugin, the first time that I invoke this, it will try to resolve the plugin through the gap coordinates. It finds it in Maven Central then downloads the jar, we can see it right there, and then executes the plugin and we see that output. So what happens when we execute the plugin again? We don't have to download anything, it's already resolved and we get the execution that we wanted. Isn't that great? I mean, it's just regular Maven. Now remember that I said something about the, uh, the source file to be, um, an executable. It's a simple main class that prints out a capitalized version of Hello World, right? So there is a plugin out there that allows you to execute code. And that was what I'm seeing here in command number one. Is I'm going to compile the code and then invoke the exec Maven plugin, latest version is 160, the Java Go, and pass in one parameter, the name of the class that I want to execute. So if I execute this command, we should see a compilation session, and then we get hello world as expected. This is great. Now, as great as it is to invoke plugins with GAF coordinates, it's a little bit uh, boresome or tiresome typing everything. There are two well-known uh, plugin groups or group IDs uh, that, that Maven is aware of. One of them is our Apache Maven plugins, and the other is our Codehouse Mojo. When this happens, 
you can invoke the goal of, of a plugin using the short ID of the plugin. The short ID is part of the documentation. And for the case of the exec maven plugin, it happens to be exec. So command number two is exactly the same thing. It does the same invocation, but notice that now it uses the show notation. So I'm going to clean so that we get a compile, a full compile session, and now execute command number two. And notice that compiles and executes correctly. Actually, probably I should update the latest version of the exec maven plugin. So here we go. Now you can use the long notation or the short notation. All right, next one, uh, dependency resolution. This is one of the reasons why many people switch from AND to Maven because before what we used to do was grab all the dependencies, do a search on the net and find a jar file, put it on our source control system and say, we're done. Oh, there's a new version. Okay, do the same thing, try to find it replace the file. And when you see, oh, this is troublesome. And then let's remove the version number from the file. And it was fun. And by fun, I mean, everybody hated that. So that's why we have now dependency resolution. It's a way for the tool to automatically download dependencies that are needed, download all those files. And to do that, we need metadata. And that metadata happens to be the POM file itself. OK. <clears throat> so we know that we can define uh, your dependencies using the dependencies block. And dependencies that are found there are known as direct dependencies. If any of these direct dependencies happen to have, because uh, other dependencies, because each one of these dependencies, the first ones, the direct ones, must have a POM file, they will also probably have a dependencies block of their own. Those dependencies in that other block will be known as transitive dependencies. And you can see a full graph of dependencies going on around now. There are two set of rules for resolving dependencies, one that governs direct dependencies and another that governs uh, transitive dependencies. For the case of your direct dependencies, uh, the dependency that is listed last wins. So if you have a matching group ID and Actify ID, the last one that appears, regardless of the version number, will be the one that wins. And this takes into consideration the hierarchy that you may have. So you may have a dependency in your grandfather pump and then your parent pump and your actual pump. If it's the same group ID and artifact ID, the version number that is found in your child pump, your current pump, is the one that is going to win, not the parent, not the grandparent. And in the case of a transitive dependency, the rules is different. It's not the last one that wins, it's the closest ones. So if you were to visualize the graph, and if you have the same group ID artifact ID in two different positions, one is like one hop away from your palm, and another is three or four hops away, even if this one has a version number that is bigger, is more recent than the one that is at one hop away, this one, the one that is closest, regardless of its version, is going to be chosen. Okay. So last year, I ran a quiz time on dependency resolution. I posted 14 questions. And that uh, this was a fun questionnaire. And um, I'm going to show just two questions <clears throat> of this questionnaire. The first question is this one. Given the POM file that has duplicate versions, I mean, duplicate definitions of Guava but with different versions, what is going to happen? And I know it's easy to make fun of Guava because everybody wants to make fun of Guava. Uh, but this problem that appears here is not specific to Guava. It's duplicate dependencies. So if I were to resolve dependencies for Maven, which version is going to win? Is it going to be version 27 because the first? Or is it going to be version 28 because it's the last? Or is this a build error? Turns out, does this actually work? So when you run the dependency tree um, command on Maven, you get an output like this. And now you may be thinking, hold on a second. What is that dependency thing being doing there? That's the short name for the Maven dependency plugin. And three is the goal. Because the Maven dependency plugin is part of that blessed set of group IDs so or Apache Maven plugins. So that's why I can invoke the dependency tree using the show notation. Now you know if you didn't know what was happening right here. So what we're seeing here is that Maven says, ah, 
you have um, a, a POM file that is not exactly what I was expecting. You have duplicate versions of the same dependency, version 27 and 28, but I'm going to allow it for now. And the result version turns out to be version 28. Why? Because these are two direct dependencies and the second one wins. So here's another question. Let's turn this around. <clears throat> now let's put Guava as a transitive dependency. This is question five of the questionnaire. Well, Google Juice and Google Truth have Guava as a transit dependency in one hub. That is important. So they are at the same distance in the graph. But Google Juice depends on Guava version 25 and Truth depends on Guava version 27. So if I resolve dependencies, what's going to happen? Is it going to be version 25 or 27 of Guava? Or I'm going to get an error? Well, no, I don't get an error. And what I do get is when I resolve dependencies is version 25, which is the first one that it finds, not the last one. So this is different from transitive dependencies. So I can show you a demo of that. Let's go into a different project and then we go a uh, transitive one. And then we do this. So simple project, GAD coordinates, juice and truth are listed in that order. So when we invoke uh, dependency tree, we should get uh, Guava 25 as the resolve version. And that is correct. Now, what happens if we invert the order? So we go into transitive two, and now I show you the POM file. And I have true first, and juice is second. And when I resolve the dependencies, <clears throat> Now I get Guava 27. Oh, Lord, this is bad. Because depending on the order of your transitive of your direct dependencies definition, you may get a different transitive dependencies. This is part of what is known as the Maven, uh, the class path hell. Because uh, what else can we do? Well, one way to do to solve this problem is Let's, let's put Guava as a direct dependency and uh, ship it. And this is Friday and then off we go. Well, yeah, true. But then you, if you have a very large set of dependencies that are transitive, well, are you going to define every single one as, trans, as, as explicit as a direct one? Uh, I don't think that is a good idea. So what can we do about this? Is there something that we can do to fix this? Uh, yeah. Uh, let's go back to the slides and we see something. <clears throat> so what's going on here? I asked this question, as you can tell, March 26th of last year, 2020. And uh, when I posted about this question, uh, this, this, uh, this particular problem, and uh, Robert Schulter, the Apache Maven PMC chair, has this to say. So ne Maven never looks at the version number. No, it never. It always looks at the dependency in the location in the tree or in the graph. Now, this is what maybe how, how it was designed back there. It may be time for Maven to start looking at the version number. This is something that, that, uh, that Robert says. But in the meantime, there are a few ways that you can solve this problem. One way is to use the Maven enforcer. Another way is to use the dependency management block. So this is what we do. This is one way to solve it for all cases. Here you have the project again, the GAP coordinates, the two dependencies, truth and use, but a dependency management block. And in the dependency management block, we say, if you encounter this dependency with this group ID artifact ID, so the artifact ID and group ID of Guava, I want you to select version 282-GRE. It does not matter if Guava is direct or Guava is transitive. It does not matter anywhere in the graph where Guava will be found. It could be one time, zero times, or as many times. If it's found, then the version number is going to be version 28. And uh, I can show you that if we go into the third version of this. And I showed you the POM file. Uh, dependency management have version 29 now defined there. I have truth and juice. So we know that truth will bring in Guava 27 
and Jules will bring in guava 25, right? So we do one more time, we resolve dependencies. And notice what happens now is that the resolve version of guava is going to be 29. And if I were to embed the order juice first and truth second, the version of guava will continue to be version 29. Okay. So the Maven Enforcer plugin, uh, I love this about the, uh, the plugin, the Love in Iron Fist of Maven, because it's a guarantee that when you configure the Maven Enforcer plugin, this is going to break your build. It's likely that there's a latest version of Maven Enforcer, this version the 300, is no longer M2 or M5. Uh, what's going to happen is that when you configure the rules for the Maven Enforcer, <clears throat> it's very, very likely that your pong file is working, but is not working as best as it could be. And the enforcer rules are going to break that. And that's the one thing that you want. You want to be sure that Maven is not doing more work that is needed and that is not uh, doing something under the covers because we missed some particular configuration. In this case, proper dependency resolution. So I asked another unscientific poll about the Maven Enforcer plugin and turns out that not that many people use Enforcer and there are more people that have no clue what the Maven Enforcer plugin is. So right now I can tell you is the way that you can verify that your pump and your project is building correctly. You can enforce dependency convergence you can enforce a particular version for Maven, for Java, for properties, for checksums, for files, if it exists, if it doesn't exist. There are many rules that you can ask for. And uh, so give it a try to the Maven Enforcer plugin if you haven't done so already. Just go and click it through the uh, dependency resolution um, questionnaire. There is the, the results of all the questions that were asked. And uh, number 14, that's the number of people that got all questions correct. So out of 505 people, only seven, and I'm not one of them, got all questions correct. This shows that we as an industry, or at least the people that respond this, have various degrees of knowledge of how the dependency resolution have, uh, works on Maven. So we should be getting better at this because Maven has been with us for uh, 19 years, 10 and 12 years or so. So yeah, it's it's been a while. And uh, if you want to know about the, uh, the exact questions and the answers and the lessons learned for the questions, the URL, you can see it at the top where you can find everything right there. So one thing that I want to point out is the number of errors in the first question. This is the question that asks, if I have duplicate direct dependencies, should this be a built error? 35% of the people said, yes, this is an error. But as we saw, it's not. It's a warning in Maven 3. I can't tell yet if it's going to be an error on Maven 4, but you can turn it into an error if you use the Maven Enforcer plugin. Because apparently, this is something that is expected by 35% of respondents. OK, if you want to know more how to get away from the, uh, the Maven dependency hell, have a look at this excellent um, presentation from Robert himself and from uh, Ray Sang, uh, two fellow Java champions. They will tell you about dependency management block. They will tell you about enforcement and a few of the tricks going through the different use cases. So the link that you found out there, it's a link to the slides, to the video, and to other uh, resources. Okay, let's get into this one. And uh, it's, it's kind of an interesting one. Uh, maybe in clean style. Should we do maybe in clean style or not? Well, the first rule of Maven Club is you do not do Maven clean style. And as you know, the second rule should be you definitely do not do Maven clean style. What you should do is Maven Verify. And if this meme is too um, gritty and dark for you, Maven Verify will put rainbows on your build. So what's going on here? Well, the usage of Maven Clean install is a cargo call from the Maven 2 era. At the time, 
Maven did not have incremental compilation, incremental builds. And we were not pretty sure that plugins were working as they needed. So we all will have to uh, restart the whole compilation session and do a full clean. But now Maven 3 has uh, incremental builds. And as you know, Maven has a series of life cycle phases. Uh, compile is a phase, test, package, generate resources, verify, install, site, clean, all those things. The verify phase is the phase that is right before install. And it's at this point where if you have a multi-project build, all the intermediate jars are available in the reactor. We typically do install because if we have a project, a, a sibling project that requires one of his siblings, it needs to resolve them from a repository, right? So that's why we put things in the local repository. But if you do verify, it's going to work. As long as you don't have a test that explicitly talks to a, a Maven repository, the use in Mary, Ver, Maven verify is enough. You don't have to push intermediate artifacts to Maven local just to make things work. When you do this, and if you're working with a snapshot, it certainly works, but if you forget to push an intermediate snapshot and then run a test case, it might fail. If you do verify, you're not pushing anything to a local repository and you will get the latest bits. The other thing, the other reason not to do install is that you're doing file copying. IO is slower than doing using things directly on memory or just referencing to the file that is already there in the reactor. So don't do that. So Robert has another great session going through the history of Maven. And he can tell you more background of why clean and install used to work as it was and how things work right now. And why will it be again a good idea to stop using clean install and do verify instead. Next one, this uh, is a feature that I thought Maven didn't have. This is something that I like from Gradle. And that is the fact that on any sub project, you can invoke pretty much any goal you want or any task. In Maven, Maven is kind of like design from, from, the bot, from the top to the bottom. So you have to invoke commands from the root. And if you want to reach into a child, uh, things can get a little bit ugly. But with these two command flags, we can do better. So the idea for this is to execute a partial reactor. So reactor is the name for all the projects that are part of a multi-project build. Uh, the reactor executes the given goal for all projects. So if you say something like maybe compile in a multi-project build, it's going to invoke all the lifecycle phases until compile for each project. This is what is expected. If you pass in dash PL, PL stands for project list, and you pass a list of paths, not project names, but paths, then it will execute the given goals for all those projects in that set of paths. But if one of those projects requires another sibling to build, it's going to fail. That's why we have the additional flag called AM, which stands for also make. In this case, yeah, Maven will compute the graph, the minimum graph that is needed for all those paths in PL to be built. Okay, so I can show you an example of that. Uh, let's go into partial one and uh, let's do the following. So this is the following structure. I have a root POM file right there and four projects, one to four, each one with a source file. Okay, so let's look at the roots. Just gap coordinates and four modules. These are not artifact like this. These are paths. And because my subprojects have the same names, this match. The typical case for Maven projects is to have my subprojects in the adjacent directories. That's why this name matches that name exactly. But if I were to have this in another deeper directory, then this value will have to change. Okay, so project one has this POM file. It just gap coordinates and a reference to its parent. Project two 
is gap coordinates, its parent, and a reference to project one. So in order to build project two, I need to build project one. Okay. Then project three, gap coordinates, and depends on project two, which means in order to build three, I need two and one. And two and one depend on the parent. So I need four projects to build three. And finally, for project four, gap coordinates, and it depends on no one except for its parent. So I need two projects to build project four. Okay. So I'm going to do a clean just to be sure that I have nothing here. Here we go. And I say Maven build project three, let's do and compile, right? Repet remember, three depends on two, one, and parent. Let's do that. Let's compile. And of course, we got a failure because project two cannot be resolved. And this is when most people say, oh, obviously, let's do an install and problem solve. Well, not really. Let's do verify. Let's see if this actually works. As I said, no, it does not. But again, same problem. It needs to resolve project two from a repository. Mm. Do I do install? No, I do not. I simply say dash M. And here we go. Oh, look at that. We got a sub reactor for the root and the three projects that I need. And it goes and happily and invokes everything that I needed. And project three is working correctly. Yay, it works. Okay, one more thing. Uh, project three source main Java main is a class that is executable. Uh -huh. Can we do the following? Instead of doing verify, and this thing is already compiled, but I want to do compile. I also want to execute that class so we know that we should be able to do this, right? Exec main class, that's the parameter that is expected. And now we need com acme main. This means we want to execute the class that is found in project three, right? Okay, here we go. The reactor is correctly, but we got a failure. Uh, what's going on here? We got the exec plugin being executed on the root pod, for, uh, on the root project. And the root project is telling me, I don't know where to find this class because the class actually belongs to project three. And that's kind of a problem. What's going on here? Well, oops, I got you. Because as you may recall, when you invoke goals on a reactor, those goals are passed into every project. That means the root one, two, and three. And only three is able to handle that particular class. So what's going on here? This is one of the things that is easy to set up in Gradle, but for Maven, we need to do um, a few more uh, steps of configuration. Um, it's not so bad. So let me tell you what's going to do. So what we have to do is make sure that the plugin that you want to invoke is configured on every single project that will be part of the React. This means we have to change the POM files. We cannot invoke the exact plugin as is. We have to put it in the POM files. And we have it to put it in such a way that it will be disabled for projects that we don't care about it. And it has to be enabled for projects for which we do care. Sometimes, you will have to define dummy values because it's not enough <clears throat> for some parameters. It's not enough to simply say disable the plugin. The plugin will still verify that its configuration is valid, even if it's not going to be invoked. So what do I mean by this? Let's go into a fixed version of this. Uh, uh, this will be partial number two. And notice what happened now. So it's the same structure as before. So for projects and a root, but the root now looks different. We have two properties, which you could define the command line, but because we know we're going to deal with exec, we just put them there in the properties block. So we skip execution by default. And we define a dummy value for main class, just so that the, the validation is correct, but semantically invalid. 
Then we lack dependency management. We have a plugin management block, which means that whenever there is a match for the, gra the group ID artifact uh, ID coordinates of a plugin, the given version and configuration may also be reused. So in this case, we're just saying we're going to use Excite Maven plugin. I think that inherited is true by default, so we could take that out. And that the next thing is we are telling here that we want to apply the exact Maven plugin. It's not just say I want this particular setup, but I also want to apply it, which means the root will have it and every child will have it. So project one through four will have the exact Maven plugin disabled by default. Oops. Uh, I need to quit the window. Here we go. So if I show you project one, the POM file stays the same. Project two, exactly the same as before. Project four, exactly the same as before. The only change again now will be project three because this one we do want to execute. So notice the only thing that we do here is change the name for main class because we know what's the main class that we want to use. And I could have used exec skip equals false, but the other way that I did it was to redefine or to pass in the configuration for exec maven plugin, passing that skip as false. So you can do both if you want. All right, let's do a clean again. And now let's do what we, uh, what we thought we could do before, which is gm uh, dash dm dash pl project tree e, compile and exec java. We no longer have to pass in the, uh, the main class because it's found in the POM file. So let's do that. And it works and we get the output. And if we look at the execution of the plugins, we see for the root build, here is exec that is being uh, skipped. For project one, exec is also skipped. For project two, exec again is skipped. And finally, for project three, we got the execution. So it's a little bit more involved, but you can make it happen. And uh, we're almost there. I think there are a handful of questions and uh, we have around less than 50 minutes to go. Finally, aggregating pumps. You have found this already. You know what aggregating pumps are. Aggregating pumps are just pumps like any other pump that happen to have a modules section. That's the only thing. Now, typically you find parent pumps with a module section, but that does not mean that every parent pump is an aggregating pump and vice versa. Not every aggregating pump happens to be a parent pump. Why is this important for this, this particular use case? I don't think I have it uh, set up correctly, but uh, let's say that you have this and uh, let's change the names. You are consuming a dependency, say common slang. And the latest version of common slang or the version that you're using has a bug. And uh, how would you go around to fix this? Well, you could clone the project, do the fix, do maybe an install, obviously, consume the version in your project and test it out. This works, perfect. It doesn't work you have to go back to common slang, fix the problem again, push it with install, then go back to your project and test it again. It doesn't work, you keep doing this cycle until it's done. That it's troublesome and takes time. It will be much, much better if your version of common slang and your version of your project will be part of the same build because then it's just a matter of simply saying at the top, Maven test or maybe verify and both common slang and your plugin or your project will just compile and that's the thing. So that's exactly what I think I may have an example of this. Uh, let's do aggregator and uh, let's do a clean here. Uh, yes, I do have a, a concrete example of this to show. Right. So we have my project and that consumes common slang. I can say my project bomb file. And uh, so those are my gap coordinates. And this is my fixed version of common slang. 
And then I have common slang supposedly cloned for the source repository. And that the only thing that I'm doing here, because I want to test out my things, I put it a different version number. This could be the next version, this next snapshot version of common slang, where it is, it's a version that is not published. So far, so good. So notice that at the top, I have another POM file. And this POM file looks like this. Any name, doesn't matter the group ID. What matters is it has modules. It has the common slang that I'm going to fix and my project. So now I can simply say verify from the top. And it builds common line, my version, and it builds my project. So now I have a much faster iteration cycle when trying to fix problems in common slang that my consumer requires. And notice that I don't have to have a parent because my project does not depend on the undefined parent. As a matter of fact, it could have its own parent, it could be completely different from common slang. Why? Because the aggregator is not the parent. That's the beauty of this thing. Okay, uh, so we're almost done. The, fin the final thing is the BOM files. Um, this is one of those features that were not really well understood based on the dependency resolution quiz that I, that I ran. Basically a BOM file is like any other BOM file that has a dependency management block. And it, most of the times it only defines dependency management and nothing more. It could define a lot of dependencies. And then the next thing that you do is that you consume these BOM files. And the, the idea is that the BOM file will suggest you which version numbers for particular dependencies can be used. There are other BOM files that will force a version if they apply the dependency. This is not something that it's uh, recommended, but it's something that you may find out there. So this is how we consume the BOM file. In our consumer, we again define the dependency management block and we define the gap coordinates for the BOM file, but we have two additional properties. The scope has to be import and type has to be POM. If type is undefined, maybe we'll try to resolve this as a jar file. And because BOM files do not have any binaries, it's going to fail. So it has to be POM file. So once we do this, the version of Guava that is resolved here is going to come out from the BOM file that we just imported. The order on which you import the BOM files is very, very important because the last one will win. Okay, so that's it. That's all that I have right now in terms of Maven features. There are a few other Maven features that I could have talked about, but that we only have uh, about an hour. And uh, with this, uh, now I am looking at Maven with different eyes, with a different perspective. I thought that it was just a simply dumb XML executed engine, but it's definitely much more complex than that. It has many more features that I didn't bother looking at, again, because I saw just XML and nothing more. It does add that with time, you actually don't see the XML. Anymore, it's like what closure people or least people say they don't see the parentheses. Where new is when they see lips curves, like oh, parentheses all over the place. I don't understand. With Megan, it's the same deal. At the beginning, it's like oh, XML, oh, ugly, and later it's like yeah, it's there, but I can see the content. I know where the structure is, so it's really not that bad. So I have some resources for you. Uh, I started writing a series of understanding Megan uh, from zero to to advance. I'm still working on it. Is the first um, in, the, in the first link. The second link is from another fellow Java champion, uh, Chandra Kuntur, which goes and explain Maven uh, with the faces and, uh, and different options that I haven't yet touched on, on my own series. And if you happen to use Gradle still, and if you miss <clears throat> sorry, some of the things that you can do with Maven, then there is a set of Gradle plugins that can help you with that. So with this, I think that I have everything. And uh, so I guess we now open for questions. I'm going to stop sharing so that I can see the, uh, the questions. Oh, there we go. All right. Wow, uh, there's a few comments. I'm going to start from, from I don't know what's going to be the oldest. Here we go. Um, so what is bad? Bad is a command line tool 
uh, similar to CAT that um, outputs uh, the contents in colors and also those automatically less. So if you are using Homebrew, you can install it from there or just search for bad command line and you'll find it. Uh, oh, there was a link to SharkDP, but that's it. Perfect, thank you. Um, so what motivated me to look back at Maven? What I didn't like about Gradle? So the thing is that Maven continues to be the dominant built tool in the market. So as much as in at my time when I used to push Gradle a lot, I simply say, oh, switch your complete build system to Gradle, forget about Maven. And uh, that kind of worked for me because, hey, I love Gradle, but that didn't quite work for everybody else because they might not have been used to Gradle. So I was forcing a decision based on, um, on something that is not really technically wise. Why? Just because I didn't like the other tool. And there is one inherent problem with Gradle. It's not the DSLs, but now you have two choices. Would you like to use Groovy or you have to use Kotlin? And you will find examples in one or the other and not, and, and not the other is like, uh. the fact that, I, that gives me more trouble with Gradle right now is that they break compatibility every single time. And they change their mind in the idiom. So you, whenever you upgrade to a new version, you might need to rewrite your build file certain aspects uh, because things are either deprecated <clears throat> or removed. And just the fact of upgrading to the latest version, <coughs> sorry, just so constantly, it just doesn't work for me anymore. So that's what I was looking at maybe because there I have so many teams working with alongside inside the company and outside that continue to use Maven. So it makes sense to understand the build tool better. I know about Maven Polyglot and that's the last thing that I want to say about Maven Polyglot because if it worked, everybody will be using it. It's not worth it. For those that do not know, let me say something. Maven Polyglot, the idea is that you can write a POM file without XML and use Ruby, Ruby, Scala, many other options. You can even use JAML, I think. The problem with Maven Polyglot is that it does not matter what uh, format you use to build, uh, to create a POM file. In the end, there has to be a valid POM XML file that has to be published to Maven Central. So there has to be a translation. It, the Polyglot will do it for you, but there are a few things that are not, but not everything is fully supported. And the other option for, um, for, uh, for this is to use um, attributes instead of full XML. But again, if Polyglot were that good, everybody will be using it right now. And the fact is that almost no one uses Maven Polyglot. Well, so I think that this is all that I have for now. Uh, so thank you very much. If you have any additional questions, uh, feel free to, to reach out to me. I'm always available on, on GitHub, on Twitter, and other events. So thank you very much for your time. Uh, thank you very much for all the uh, sponsors and the, uh, the crew for, for JCon for making this a great conference. And I hope that you continue enjoying the conference and uh, see you at uh, the other side. Thank you very much.